Hi, this is Julie Roca, and you have found the podcast Aging Gracefully with Julie Roca. You know, sometimes as we age, getting out of the house to go to doctor's appointments is hard. In COVID times, um, it was dangerous, actually. So I have been blessed to know some wonderful providers that will go into the home. And I think we're coming back to something that we used to utilize back in the beginning of the Americas and even in Europe um, when we had the visiting physicians. And so today I brought in Logan Andrews, who is one of my favorite um, traveling providers who I have known for years since you were director of nursing way back in a skilled nursing facility years ago. And I feel like you were still studying to be where you're at now. So welcome, Logan. Thank you. So, Logan, what brought you to um, to doing what you do now? Well, so actually it starts whenever I was the director of nursing um, at the rehab that I was at uh, where – I first met you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of noticed whenever I was there that there were a lot of our residents at the time that were coming in for short-term rehab, and we're kind of getting labeled as our frequent flyers. Yeah. Well, as we kind of took a deep dive into that, and then Medicare kind of changed the way that they pay rehabs and whatnot, we had to really start looking at our hospital uh, readmission numbers right. and what contributed to that. So one of the things I found was there were a lot of these residents that were discharging home. Mm -hmm. They did not have a PCP or maybe was that they had a primary, but they didn't have transportation to get there. Yes. And where we are located at it, there is limited resources available to a lot of people for transportation. If you don't live in a city like Gainesville, for example, where there is a regional mm-hmm. transport system, then out in the outlying communities, there's really not anything. There's, yeah. if you're lucky, you can try to get with like uh, Swanee River Economic Council has a transport system. Yep. Um, but then again, it's still kind of hard because you might be on the bus all day for a 45 minute appointment. Right. And when you are, when you're a, a little tiny lady and you're trying to give care for your husband who may be larger than you, just getting them in and out of the car is a huge ordeal. I mean, it, it's almost impossible for some people. And that's what we were seeing. Yeah. That was the other thing that, that we saw too. So because of all that, whenever at the time I was going back to school to become a nurse practitioner, and that's actually what led me to that. So I found that out. We started having the social services department there tracking a lot of these um, residents and the reason why they weren't following up. We even would mm-hmm. call them up to two weeks after to find out, did you follow up with your PCP? And then we'd actually try to even schedule appointments for them so that we could try to get them seen within 7 to 14 days of discharge from the rehab. And then from all that, like I said, I became an MP, and I just had NP, this— NP is what? Nurse practitioner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, once I became the nurse practitioner, you know, I was just like, you know, this is what I want to do. And yeah. I started out at first and thought maybe I would see what it was like, and now I've come to just love it. And now we have for, uh, for my— home care practice, my uh, house call practice. It's called Andrews Healthcare Consulting. Mm -hmm. We now have uh, 10 providers and we cover from Cedar Key to Steenhatchee straight across the state now to St. Augustine and even parts of Jasper, Jennings and Mexico Beach. Wow. And you are just absolutely passionate about providing that care. I love that about you. Um, sometimes in my line of work, I do placements in assisted livings and in memory cares and in independent living. We've needed to call you. There are certain paperwork that needs to be filled out that it seems really difficult for some people, you know, like if you're having to transport your loved one and it's hard or, um, for example, if they typically go to the VA and they don't necessarily have a PCP. They could be seeing just anybody at the VA. It can be hard to get in and see people. Um, so you have been able to step in and bring services that we have desperately needed for our clients. So I'm grateful for that. One of the questions that we get, and I know that you get a lot, is does insurance cover your services? So, yeah, I get asked that all the time. The other question I get asked in addition to that is, 
uh, how much is this going to cost in addition mm-hmm. to what my insurance pays? Yeah. And the question is, it's actually covered by insurance. Even Medicaid and a lot of commercial plans uh, that people get through their own employer will actually cover for a house call visit. Okay. Um, Medicare doesn't ever really have any problem, and there's no additional copay for that. I do know there are other mobile providers that charge a fee to come out, but we do not. We accept whatever is paid through your insurance. Okay. Of course, now with that being said, some insurance plans, all of them are different. Some do have a, a copay or a deductible or patient responsibility. But generally, that amount that you would pay is no different than if you went to the brick and mortar clinic. So, for example, if you have a $25 copay to go see your primary up the street at his office, it would still be $25 for me to come see you at home. Yeah, yeah. So that brings up another great question. Um, And this may not be every mobile provider, but for your practice, do you have an age limit? Um, I do not. We actually even see peds. There are some, uh, I've actually done some house calls. Uh, I think the youngest I've seen so far has been about six months uh, because my specialty is actually family. So I can see everyone across the lifespan. Um, So yeah, no, it's not just for older people. We mainly, most of those, if we see or seeing the pediatric patients, nine times out of 10, it's mainly for a sick visit. You know, they couldn't get into their primary or mom couldn't get off work or, you know, there was just extenuating factors that they need to see at home. Right. And uh, one of the things we face a lot of times is that there's going to be an in-home caregiver that is, they're, they're so focused on giving care to their loved one that they don't take care of themselves. And so, you know, one of the things that we always shout out is, hey, take care of yourself. If you're not taking care of yourself, how can you give the best care to your loved one? So I think it's very important to think about the fact that not only will you come out and visit the loved one, but you can also visit the person that's giving care so that you can help them to stay as healthy as possible. And I love that about your services too. Um, and, uh, so what about in home, like blood work and x-rays, ultrasounds, EKGs, do you still have to send people out for that? No, actually we've partnered with many local area providers that cover that for us. So we have a mobile imaging company that we use and we've partnered with, they provide x-rays and ultrasounds, even EKGs in the comfort of the patient's home. Again, blood work is something else that we've also contracted with. So Mm -hmm. we have a company, a third party that we use, and they'll come out to the home as well and do the blood work. Another thing that we've started doing as well is we now have a site division of our organization as well. So that's also been something huge that we noticed was definitely needed in the area is site because they're just so limited site providers. Right. So we have a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. She does do some house calls. She does a lot of telepsych, meaning that she does it over like Zoom or FaceTime with some of the Mm -hmm. patients. Mm -hmm. And um, she's also available to all of our other clinicians for anything that might be going on that we need to consult with her site related to our patients. That's fantastic. Uh, one of the things I wanted to make sure to mention is that you will go to the patient's home of choice. So that doesn't just mean they need to be in their house where they grew up. It could mean that they've chosen to be in an assisted living or in a memory care community or independent living community or even in a skilled nursing community, right? Correct. So that they don't have to go out for every single appointment which is so valuable to families that are trying to, they're still trying to work, a lot of them. Um, They may be raising children. And so having to rearrange their entire schedule to go and be with a loved one at an appointment, it's not always possible. So having you be able to go and visit them in their skilled nursing facility or in their assisted living, and then they can get a report back is so valuable. Yeah, so we that's one of the things that we do, and that's, I think, what has helped us to be so successful and have such a good patient pace is that, you know, we try to provide the whole um, continuum of care. And with mm-hmm. that being said, we're following, that means we follow the patient in the home, uh, whether that's their actual physical home that they've grew up in, like you mentioned, right. the ALF, maybe they've went to the hospital and they required some skilled nursing services or rehab for a broken hip, something like that. Mm-hmm. We would also follow them. You in know, the in, the rehab. in the rehab and okay. and the hospital. That's the other thing, too. So I'm actually credentialed with North Florida Regional. 
And then also with select specialty. So I have access to a lot of those patients whenever they go in there and I can help coordinate stuff with the team. And most of the time, whenever the patients are make the hospital staff aware that, hey, my primary care is, and then, you know, says my name or my organization, they will normally go ahead and tag them on our team service in the hospital. Okay. And they're very good about calling me and, you know, saying, hey, so-and-so's in the hospital. This is what's going on with them. What were you doing at home? What medications were they on at mm-hmm. home? That way they're not reinventing the wheel. That's so helpful. And honestly, I see all the time you've got patients going to their primary care physician and going to a heart doc and going to a lung specialist and going to a urologist. And before you know it, they've got 50 different medications. Honestly, they have no idea what they're taking. And oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really great to have somebody that's kind of at the helm managing all of that and knowing what's going on with your patient in every aspect, right? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, speaking on that too, like you mentioned, so something else that we also provide is if we have patients that don't necessarily – want to lose their primary care, but they're just unable to go Mm -hmm. for, say, they've had surgery, like I mentioned, and they're unable to leave their home for an extended amount of time, then we kind of step in as a transitional care provider, where then we are just literally acting like a Band-Aid. So we are seeing them long enough for them to get better to be able to go back to their normal primary care. And then, of course, we share all of our records and everything and any medication changes we might have made with that regular PCP so that then when they are able to go back, um, it's a smooth transition for them. That's awesome. That's a great service and a great point because, again, I mean, it could be it could be me having knee surgery and I yep. find it very difficult to get in and out of my car. And so having you to be able to follow along while I'm home is really helpful. Um, I saw on your bio, uh, you've served as the long-term care board of representatives for the North Central Florida Healthcare Coalition for two terms in over 11 counties. Yeah. So that was a really cool organization and it's still around. It actually is a uh, state organization Mm -hmm. that's funded by the state. Uh, It was It's actually for emergency preparedness and emergency services. So with that, I was the long-term care board representative, meaning I was actually the person that was kind of helping head all of the long-term care facilities, whether that was a hospice house or um, hospice care center to assisted living facilities mm-hmm. to even the nursing homes nursing. and long-term care. Yeah, for that for the those 11 counties. So it was kind of, I was asked to do that and I did. I didn't realize it was going to be quite as big as it was. Uh, that's and a big responsibility. <laughs> it definitely was. And it exploded whenever COVID hit because uh, mm-hmm. I was actually in that position when COVID hit. And that was huge because I was actually having to help coordinate a lot of PPE disbursement between all of the ALFs and rehabs because at the time it seemed like everything was going to the hospital and we were kind of forgotten about. The last, yeah, Yeah, the last in line. You know, I had to make calls. I was in contact with people in Tallahassee and all this kind of stuff trying to get, you know, supplies needed and trying to arrange for supplies. And then the other thing too, you know, there were some rehabs that Maybe they were non-for-profit and then other ones that were for-profit. Some of them actually had a lot of stuff in stock and some didn't. So then it was like, hey, we know you have a lot of this in your building. Would you be willing to share share. it? Mm -hmm. So that was going on and it ended up being a really, really awesome thing. And I think it really also brought to the table um, the responsibilities, the needs, and actually what the rehabs or nursing homes are capable of. Um, in those situations. Mm -hmm. And it really opened up a lot of the hospital administration staff's eyes to, wow, they actually can do a lot more than we thought. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's education for them um, to know what, what kind of facility can handle what kind of patient, because, you know, everybody says, oh, I I need to put grandma in a nursing home. Well, there's a lot of steps before a nursing home. So, um, and that's what I love to talk about with people, because that's what I do is, you know, placement in those in those different communities. So I would always love to have a conversation with people before they just say, I got to put mom in a nursing home. Um, Tell me a story. (laughs) Well, um, if you want to know a story about a home care patient, there's one that sticks out very, very fondly to me. Um, I had a I had this lady that I was following. She has since passed away. Um, But 
her niece had reached out to me about seeing her. And here recently, probably, is, I think it's been about two years ago now, there were, was a lot of flooding in Dixie County. Mm-hmm. And um, this particular patient of mine was bed bound. They could not get out of the bed whatsoever. I was having to see them. And the niece called me one day and she's like, hey, my aunt's got this going on. I'm really worried about her. She doesn't want to go to the hospital, but um, I, I think she needs to be seen. And mm-hmm. I said, okay, I'll try to get out there to you. She said, well, I'm just going to warn you, you I'm, you're going to have to wear waders or something because <laughs> the water is like <laughs> knee deep to waist deep in areas coming to the house. And the house was kind of like up on a little hill. So, of course, I have a big jacked up truck. So I was able to get out there a good ways in the water. You for... just needed a kayak <laughs> is what you needed. Right. That would have made it a lot more I definitely fun. needed a kayak <laughs> that time, <laughs> something like that. But I, I got out and um, I forgot my darn waders and boots at the house. Thank goodness her... Um, brother had some, so he met me and gave me some to wear. So I was able to get inside the house, take care of her. And she actually was doing bad enough. She needed to go to the hospital. So I talked her into going and, um, we called EMS. They came out, same thing. They actually had to carry her above the water to get her to the ambulance because it was so far away, but it worked and she got a little bit better, came home. But obviously, she had a lot going on. She did end up going on hospice services shortly after that and pass away. But that was something that I can say, I was like, you know, had I not gone out there, it makes me wonder what would have happened to her Mm -hmm. if she didn't have somebody that was able to go to the house. And of course, that's like one of those crazy scenarios where, yeah, yeah, it just happened to flood then. Had it not, it would have been a little bit different. But but that's definitely one story of mine that... um, I probably will never forget. And that's whenever it really set with me that like, hey, what you're doing is needed and is important. And yes, and I love it. I used to I grew up watching um, what was her name? Her name was Michaela something, Dr. Quinn, medicine woman. And she would go to the home and care for people. And I remember thinking, man, that must have been so much easier because at that point, um, we were starting to see some signs and symptoms in my grandparents as I was a young adult, I was still watching this, and getting them to the primary care physician without having him, you know, decide he's going to get out of the car and just go for a run um, in Gainesville. It, that was challenging. And I thought, man, we need the day to come back when you've got providers coming out to the house. And so that to me, that story is one of those like Dr. Quinn medicine women just kind of braving all the elements and getting to the patient's house so you can, you know, it, basically save her life for another day. Um, I love that story. Yeah, I can say that, you know, I'm I'm grateful to be able to do what I do. And I, I see the need and I'm, I'm glad that we're able to do it. And I think the reason more providers probably do not do it is it's it's hard to see the number of patients that you need to see in mm-hmm. order to to make a good living, so to speak. I mean, if you think about mm-hmm. it in a clinic setting, you can see 15, 15 people, 20, 20, 30 patients, yeah. you know, yeah. in a day, that's almost impossible doing house calls because you got to think about the drive time between each patient um, to the amount of time that you're spending there because you're spending on average, I mean, I'm probably never in there less than 30 minutes in somebody's mm-hmm. home uh, because once you're there, you're also having to address a lot of other stuff because most of these people that you're seeing they have a lot of chronic conditions. So it's not like you're just seeing them for a runny nose like you might would see in a clinic. So, right, right. you know, there's a lot more that's having to go on with them. And with that being said, too, I can say the visits are a lot more personable because, one, you're in the person's home. Right. You don't really get more personal than that. Right, so, yeah, you don't. Yeah, so, and it also gives me as the provider a way to learn a lot more about that patient than if I was actually seeing them in the clinic. You are truly seeing where they're coming from. You're seeing the chocolate bars on the counter of your diabetic patient. You're seeing... Or the medication bottles that are sitting there on the counter and you're like, unopened, never... And you're like, I refilled, (laughs) I filled this for you uh, last visit a month ago. Like, why haven't they been taken yet? So... So There's a lot you can see. Oh yeah, that you would never see otherwise. Yeah. And also another another really great... um, advantage to that is some of these people are literally homebound and not seeing anyone else. You are bringing, you're bringing a ray of the outside, a ray of sunshine and just kind of, hey, you're not alone. 
I'm here. And I just think it's, I think it's a treasure what you do for people. So. I've seen that too. I've had multiple patients that are 100% homebound and, you know, it's, it's hard not to want to stay and talk to them because they really want to just talk because you're like the only person that they yes. see for a long time. But, and I try to make extra time for those individuals because mm-hmm. I know who they are um, that just want to visit with you. And um, yeah, that it's, it's definitely, it's not what I thought it was going to be whenever I started. And yeah. I've, like I said, I've just, I've come to really like it and I, I don't see myself doing anything any different. I love it. So if somebody is watching from somewhere else, how would they go about finding someone who provides the services that you, kind of the same services you provide in home? How would they So find that? one way to do that is one, they can ask their insurance carrier. Sometimes, uh, depending on which providers are in network with certain provider, uh, insurance carriers can be able to tell them or their insurance case manager. That's how I've gotten uh, quite a few patients of you know okay. for our practice is the insurance provider reached out and said, hey, we know that you provide house calls. Are you accepting new patients? Yeah. Um, other times, uh, we've had organizations such as um, like uh, elder organizations. One here is mm-hmm, like elder mm-hmm. options. Yeah, elder options here. Yeah, there's different types of community elder assistant organizations that people can reach out to. Yeah. That should be able to have that information to give to them. I think Columbia County, even in their senior center, they have a yes. nurse that's on staff that does um, recommendations for that kind of stuff too. So you could reach out to your local senior center to Mm -hmm. find out as well if you have a hard time um, getting through to a social worker with your insurance company because I know that that sometimes can be daunting too. Yeah, we've actually, speaking of senior centers, we've actually came out and spoken a couple times uh, to the senior center in Chiefland for Levy County and the one in Cross City for Dixie County. Okay. So that definitely is also a good one too because they should be able to have a lot of those resources. So for any providers that are out there that are kind of trying to get started doing what you do, that's a... Great idea. Hit your senior centers and let them know you're out there. So, well, Logan, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, Is there anything last minute that you can think of that you just really need to share? Um, I don't think so. I mean, the biggest thing is, I mean, we are accepting new patients. Okay. So if, yeah, if anybody (laughs) in, you know, listening that probably is in this area, uh, in the service areas that we cover, and they would like to reach out to us, they can. Um, they can find us online at uh, www.andrewshealthcareconsulting.com, uh, our Facebook page, and our office contact number is uh, area code 352-577-5252. And like I said, we offer in-home primary care and also psych services. So. Okay, awesome. And I'll try to leave a link down in the description uh, so that people can link directly to you. Absolutely. And thank you so much for joining us. If you would do me a great favor and like this podcast, uh, subscribe to it so you can get a notification for any new ones. And please share because without you sharing, this tool doesn't get into the hands of some of the people that need it. Thank you so much. Thank you.